Hello everyone. This is the second part of the second module of the DSM class. What's included in the DSM? Section 1 introduces the reader to the manual and makes a cautionary statement for forensic use of DSM-5. Section 2 includes 22 chapters. The first 20 chapters describe disorders that must meet the definition of a mental disorder. That means that, 1, they disturb a person's cognition, emotion regulation or behavior. 2. They are caused by an underlying psychological, biological or developmental process. And 3. They significantly interfere with social, occupational or other important life activities. There are two exceptions. The first exception are conditions included in the chapter medication-induced movement disorders and other adverse effects of medication. This chapter is important because medications are often used to manage symptoms of mental disorders. Also, professionals use it to differentiate the diagnoses of mental disorders. For example, anxiety disorder versus neuroleptic-induced akathisia. Or malignant catatonia versus neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Even though these movement disorders are labeled medication-induced, some individuals may have them in the absence of medication exposure. Therefore, the chapter's name does not imply that medication exposure necessarily causes the development of the movement disorder. Section 3 contains tools and techniques to help enhance the clinical decision-making process, understand the cultural context of mental disorders, and recognize emerging diagnoses for further study. When we talk about culture we often talk about behavioral norms, meanings, and values that members of societies use to construct their view of the world and develop an identity. Uniqueness of culture is expressed through language, religious beliefs, traditions, gender and sexual orientation, values, and socioeconomic status. These aspects can interact with the psychiatric diagnosis in multiple ways. There exists a separate field of knowledge called cultural psychiatry. Cultural psychiatry studies cultural patterns that influence the ways in which people describe, assess and manage mental health conditions. For example, we know through empirical research that many psychiatric diagnoses develop as an interplay between genetic risks and environmental influences. Still, some people claim that mental illness results from the sin, or is caused by evil spirits. In my clinical practice, I pay careful attention to the aspects of culture. I recently worked with a family where an adolescent son attempted to kill himself. He was an American boy who was born and raised in this society. A couple of years ago he went to the Middle East to visit his father's relatives. That summer, he was raped by his uncles multiple times. He told his father but father felt ashamed and afraid of potential legal problems. He chose to deny it could happen in his family. In fact, the entire family chose a narrative where the boy was crazy and just making it all up. Thus, the young child was entrapped by his traumatic memories on the one hand and in the lack of acceptance and support from the primary caregiver on the other. Working through interpreter, I helped the father understand his son's feelings. First being perpetrated, then accused in the lies and destroying the image of the family. Feeling humiliated and rejected. Unable to change the circumstances, unable to get help to deal with the horrors that took place. A child who had nowhere to go. A child who saw suicide as the only way out. Through our talks, the father has eventually discovered for himself two parallel realities. One, related to saving the honor of the family. Another, saving his son's life who developed a mental disorder because of their family's beliefs and values that did not allow an open investigation, protection and therapy for the young victim of sexual assault. Freeze the video and read this case. In this case Floyd has an ethical and possibly even a moral dilemma. To address this dilemma, Floyd should first identify the problem, Floyd needs money, Floyd was told by supervisor he won't be paid because many insurance companies do not accept fee codes. Floyd was encouraged by his clinical supervisor to change his diagnoses to get paid. The next step is to review ethical codes and laws. Improper diagnosis, improper billing, and fraudulent insurance practices are a major area of potential harm and violation for social workers. They are also harmful to the patients. Many social workers struggle with the role of diagnosis in their clinical practice and often find themselves in battles with health maintenance organizations, HMOs, and insurance companies for sessions and money. So, review again the potential benefits of the DSM diagnoses. First, they give us a common language. All clinicians are familiar with the terminology and are able to easily communicate symptom distress, signs of remission, insurance information, and this alone can aid in the treatment of patients. This shorthand for information facilitates communication within and among professional groups. Clinicians can categorize psychological problems, researchers and those who develop theories of pathology can compare various approaches to treatment for specific DSM diagnoses. 
In addition, the DSM system may help treatment planning by evaluating what works and what does not work for specific diagnoses. It helps to evaluate the underlying causal mechanisms and processes of particular diagnoses. Throughout the DSM there are relevant citations to the course, prevalence and cultural, gender, and familial issues related to each diagnosis. The DSM can also aid in helping the clinician to know when to refer a client. Receiving a referral that is outside one's expertise or competence requires some careful consideration prior to accepting the client for treatment. Ethically, clinicians are required to know their limitations. Clinicians are required to either refer a client who is outside of one's competence or to seek consultation on a regular basis while treating the client. The DSM may benefit clients when they receive a concrete explanation for their behavior and experiences. Clients have reported feeling some freedom when they have their experiences labeled. On the other hand, DSM has been criticized for its potential harm. First, family therapists have considered it problematic to diagnose one family member when the problem exists or originates within the family. Second, each era has its own garbage can diagnosis or favorite diagnosis, often given to those who do not easily fall into any other diagnostic category. Schizophrenia was once the 1950s such diagnosis, borderline personality disorder belonged to the 1980s, dissociative identity disorder, or multiple personality disorder was favored in the 1990s, and ADHD became popular in the 2000s. Clinicians must be wary of falling into the trap of stretching the symptoms to fit a favored or popular diagnosis. Third, some experts claim the DSM system contributes to the over-medicalizing of our society in that it determines how we think about social and other problems. In other words, the DSM attributes psychopathology to common behaviors allowing mental health professionals to find psychopathology where there is none or where there is merely stress or adjustment to new or complex situations. For example, homosexuality which is a variation of normal sexual behavior, used to be a mental disorder that was eliminated from the DSM-2 in 1974. Fourth, humanistic therapists question the usefulness of diagnoses in that they tend not to focus on wellness. Frankel and others have argued that a person's character is unique and cannot be labeled, judged, totally understood or identified. The client-centered approach focuses on the person's ability to diagnose him or herself, rather than the therapist doing the diagnosing. Rogers was famous for his compelling model in which the therapist considers the client from the client's frame of reference. Fifth, many clinicians feel forced to play the insurance game by providing a diagnosis that is acceptable and reimbursable to the insurance company or health maintenance organization, HMO. Giving a false or misleading insurance diagnosis is insurance fraud and misrepresentation, an ethical violation, and one of the most frequent acts of financial misconduct brought before licensing boards. Sixth, the stigma or disgrace associated with having a psychiatric diagnosis is difficult for some people, especially in various cultural groups. Most people are far more comfortable disclosing they have a medical condition rather than a psychiatric diagnosis. Fear that disclosure can cause unwanted social or occupational consequences is enough to keep some people away from seeking therapy. As social workers, it is our duty to understand all the benefits and harms of the DSM diagnoses and act ethically. Now I invite you to check your knowledge. Let's pause the lecture and read the first question. What does the term over-medicalizing refer to? A. Only medical doctors can use the DSM system accurately. B. A potential for the DSM to attribute psychopathology to common behavior. C. Clinicians who are not medical doctors try to diagnose on axis 3. The answer to question 1 is B. There is a potential to attribute psychopathology to common, everyday behaviors. Let's answer another question. How can the use of a DSM external label aid a patient? A. It helps them get reimbursed by the insurance company. B. It makes them feel understood by the clinician. C. It reduces guilt and blame. The answer to question 2 is C. Giving a label tends to reduce the guilt and blame of the patient and the patient's family members. Most of us social workers are employed in the mental health related fields. In most cases social workers are the frontline treatment providers. As such, we have a significant impact on the diagnosis. Mental disorders are highly prevalent among U.S. adolescents and adults. Suicide rates are growing. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death overall in the U.S. White, American Indian, and Alaska Native people are at highest risk of ending their lives. Why is this? 
there have been different explanations of what causes mental illness in different periods of history. The diathesis stress model is a psychological theory that attempts to explain a disorder, or its trajectory, as the result of an interaction between a predispositional vulnerability, also known as diathesis, and a stress caused by life experiences. The Greek word diathesis stands for a predisposition, or sensibility. A diathesis can take the form of genetic, psychological, biological, or situational factors. This is the graphical display of the diathesis stress model. The x-axis indicates quality of the environment experiences from negative to positive. The y-axis indicates the developmental outcome from negative to positive. The lines depict two groups of individuals. The groups differ in their responsiveness to a negative environment. The vulnerable group is shown with the red line. This group shows a negative outcome when exposed to a negative environment, while the resilient group is not affected by it. However, there are no differences between the two groups in a positive environment. The diathesis stress model asserts that if the combination of the predisposition and the stress exceeds a threshold, the person will develop a mental disorder. Risk factors can exacerbate the individual's vulnerabilities. These factors include substance use, poor sleep habits, and conflicts. On the other hand, protective factors, such as positive social networks or high self-esteem, can counteract the effects of stressors and prevent or curb the effects of disorder. Other examples of protective factors include a positive parent-child attachment relationship, a supportive peer network, and individual social and emotional competence. This week I want you to read Chapter 3 of the Jengalevsky book. In addition, I want you to follow this link to the NIH resource on mental health medication. Spend some time learning this information. There is a big chance you will get questions on medications in your licensure exam. Also, it's very likely that you will be involved in professional conversations around issues of pharmacological support to your clients.